before we do our small group. Chapter 3. This, by the way, is also, this also appears in the Sunday lectionary. This is the only part of Job, I think, that appears in the Sunday lectionary. Job said, let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night which said a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness, that may God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. If you're looking for parts of the Bible to match a sour mood, <laughs> Job is, Job's sections in this book are, are for you. Look at verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? This is a rhetorical question. He's not really wanting an answer. He's just he's expressing his great, great uh, upset. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why did the knees receive me? That's an image, that's a phrase for being born. You were born onto the knees of the midwife. Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should suck? For then I should have lain down and been quiet. So he says, so why not die at birth? So first he says, why do I not die at birth? Okay, then I would have slept with kings and counselors who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Remember, for Job, there is no heaven. There is no hell. There's just Sheol. Okay? Everybody goes to Sheol. Good people, bad people. Poor people, rich people. At least I would have been, whatever kind of wispy purpose I had, I would be with kings if I had died, uh, if I was already dead, had died at, at, at my birth. Verse 20. Why is light given to him that is in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it comes not, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures? So, great, beautiful, poetic lament. That's Job's first statement. Okay? And Eliphaz steps up. And so here we're going to hear conventional wisdom. Verse 2. If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? Yet, yet, who can keep from speaking? Behold, you have instructed many, and you have strengthened the weak. Your words have upheld him who was stumbling. So he's, remember, he's remember, reminding Job how, what an advisor he was in the past. Huh? But now it has come to you, and you are impatient. It touches you, evil, huh? and you are dismayed. Is not your fear of God, your confidence, the integrity of your ways, your hope? Think now, who that was innocent ever perished? There, there, there. That's wisdom, huh? That's last month's lesson. Who, I mean, because they would say, if you stay innocent, if you keep your nose clean, if you do your homework on time, go to bed, and you know, and, and, and on, on regular hours, you will prosper. And so, so that's what Eliphaz is, is he's reminding Joel of the wisdom tradition. Where were the upright cut off? He, he said, look at experience. Do you see anybody like that? As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God, they perish. By the blast of his anger, they are consumed. Verse 17. Can mortal man be righteous before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? Even in his servants he puts no trust. His angels he charges with error. God can see the flaws of even angels. So come on, don't think you're beyond flaws. How much more are those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth? Verse 1 of chapter 5. This is still Eliphaz. Call now, is there anyone who will answer you? To which of the holy ones will you turn? Surely vexation kills the fool, and jealousy slays the simple. I have seen the fool taking root, but suddenly I curse his dwelling. It's gone. So remember, fool, the wise man from the last time, or the wise woman and, and the, the wicked woman. His sons are far from safety, 
They are crushed in the gate, and there is no one to deliver them. His harvest the hungry eat, and he takes it even out of of thorns, and the thirsty pant after his. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble sprout from the ground. Uh, Verse 8. As for me, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause. Verse 10. For he gives rain upon the earth, and sends water upon the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. Which is echoed in the Benedictus in Luke chapter 1, by the way. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. That verse is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So notice, they quote both Benedictus and Paul are quoting not Joel, but Eliphaz, the, the, tr- the tradition of wisdom. Verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God reproves, therefore despise not the chastening of the Almighty. So what has Eliphaz done here? Well, he's, he's begged permission to, exper- to speak. He's spoken about experience, and in his experience, good people always prosper, and wicked people never prosper. He has challenged uh, he's challenged the reasoning of Job. He recommends in verse 8 of chapter 5 that he turn back to God. And in verse 17, he gives a word of encouragement. So it's a nice, tight little, you know, vo- the voice of wisdom calling Job back. And then Job responds, chapter 6, verse 4. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. This is the first time that Job has mentioned God. Okay? Um, And he's not happy. Verse 8. Oh, that I might have my request and that God would grant my desire, that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. This would be my consolation. I would even exalt in pain unsparing, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Job continues to remark on his innocence. Chapter 7. This is still Job, but he he, he moves to a lament. Lament form. We we looked at that when we read uh, the Psalms. Has not man a hard service upon earth? Are not his this is a, so this is a reflection upon on bad things happening to decent people. Has not man a hard service upon earth? Are not his days like the days of a hireling, like a slave who longs for the shadow, like a hireling who looks upon for his wages? So so he says, to be to be to be a human being is to be like a slave. You never control, you don't control things. You're not able to you know, to, to make your own will known. Skip to verse 7. Remember, and yeah, he talks to God here, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will behold me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall be gone. As the cloud fades and vanishes, so he who goes down to Sheol does not come up. He returns no more to his house, nor does he place him in his nor does his place know him anymore. And he complains to God. Therefore I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? Verse 17. What is man that you do, dost make so much of him and that you dost set your mind upon him? You know, I, we're nothing, God, so don't make us be any more than we are. Chapter 8, Bildad, the second friend, responds. We'll read a little here. How long will you say these things, and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert the right? Now again, remember, you read chapter 1 and 2, didn't you? Huh? And, and you, the reader, know, well, God kind of played kind of loose with Job. So Bildad the Build that, of course, doesn't know this. Um, if your children have sinned against him, 
He has delivered them into the power of their transgression. So Bildad says, maybe it's your kid did something wrong. Now remember, the narrator in chapter 1 said that every time Job's children had their parties, he offered sacrifices in their behalf in case they sinned. So he was sensitive to that. Verse 5, if you will seek God and make supplication to the Almighty, surely then he will rouse himself for you and reward you with a rightful habitation. And though your beginning was small, your latter days will be very great. For inquire, I pray you, of bygone ages, and consider what the fathers have found. For we are but of yesterday and know nothing, for our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you in utter words out of their understanding? Well, there's a great deal about what the friends say that's true. I mean, we are nothing. We don't live very long at all. In the face of the universe, we're so tiny. So there, there is, again, there's still truth in the wisdom tradition. Job responds in chapter 9. Truly I know that it is so. But how can a man be just before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. <coughs> he is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who, who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. So, so he says, well, he says, well, but I know, I know how it works, but God is strong and God is big and God can do whatever God wants to do. Which, by the way, is the truth of the book. Okay? Now, so the friends don't recognize it. The friends will not acknowledge that, that God can do what God wants to do. The friends say, God is like a machine. God only gives you back what you give him. Okay? So that's, 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 a con that's an accidental consequence of the retribution law. It makes God into a machine. He, that you control God. If you do the right, then right good things come. If you do bad, bad things come. He's, he's nothing more than like a pot machine. What you put in is what you get out. So, so acknowledge that. See, so the law of retribution, again, yeah, it's often the case. It is. Remember, you gnaw your teeth and they'll go away. Huh? <laughs> there is truth to it. But in a rigid approach to it, it makes God not a free supreme being, but a machine. Okay? That, this, that's what's really, that's the argument about who is God. Well, the book of Job is going to say he's not a machine. Whatever he is, he's not a machine. He is free. He can do what he will do. But again, the friends aren't ready to acknowledge that. A little more of this section here um, as he describes he who, verse 5, he who removes mountains and they know it not. This wonderful imagery about God as creator. He who removes mountains and they know it not. When he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Who commands the sun and it does not rise. Who seals up the stars. Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. Who made the bear and Orion, the Pleiades and the chambers of the south. Those are all constellations. Huh? Pleiades, maybe you recognize. Orion, maybe you recognize. Yeah. By the way, this language is going to reappear in God's speech back in chapter 38, 39. God's going to say, look at the stars. You know, now Job is already saying it. So Job is not, he's, he's got something, he's right about God. Actually, he's more right about God than the three friends are. Okay. Um, Verse 13, 11. Lo, he passes by me, and I see him not. He moves on, but I do not receive him, perceive him. Behold, he snatches away. Who can hinder him? Who will say to him, what are you doing? <laughs> so, you know, God, you know, who are we to question God, is what Job is saying here. Okay? Um, and it goes on and on. Um, Verse, chapter 9, verse 30. If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into a pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. For This is talking about God. He is not a man, as I am, that I might answer him, that we should come to trial together. There is no umpire between us. 
who might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me. Let not dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak without fear of him, for I am not as in myself. Um, I've got a lovely little poem in chapter 10, verse 9. Again, it's Job still. Remember that you have made me of clay. He's talking to God. And you will turn me to dust again. Will you, and will you turn me to dust again? Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? <laughs> Those are images of creation. Okay, like, like curd comes out of, out of milk. That, that's our creation. You did clothe me with skin and flesh and knit me together with bones and sinew. You have granted me life and steadfast love, and, you, and your care has preserved my spirit. Yet these things you did hide in your heart. I know that this was your purpose. Zophar, chapter 11, there's nothing worth reading there. Chapter 12, Job responds, verse 1 of chapter 12, No doubt you are the people. <laughs> this is sarcasm. As we go into the book, the, all the characters get more and more sarcastic. Okay? <laughs> they start out being kind of civil, but they start, end up shouting at each other. You moron. You know, what, are you, what are you thinking? So Job says, no doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. Okay? You've got to read it that way. huh? He doesn't mean it sincerely. But I have understanding as well as you. Who does not know such things as these? Look at chapter 13. Who does outside your reading? Nope, 14, okay. Verse 13, verse 6. Hear now my reasoning. Listen to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak falsely for God and speak deceitfully for him? Will you show partiality toward him? Will you plead the case for God? Because what's the issue here? Is there... They're accusing Job of being a sinner. Just admit you're sinning. And Job says, I know I'm not a sinner. I'm a righteous man. No, you can't be a righteous man. Look at you. You're suffering. So that's, that's where he's saying, so are you taking God's side against me? You're lying for God? Verse 9. Will it be well with you when he searches you out? Or can you deceive him as, you, as one deceives a man? He will surely rebuke you if in secret you show partiality. Will not his majesty terrify you and the dread of him fall upon you? Your maxims are proverbs of ash. Your defenses are defenses of clay. Let me have silence and I will speak. Let come on me what may. I will take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand. Behold, he will slay me. I have no hope. Yet I will defend my ways to his face. It's a great line. He knows, Job knows he's innocent. I will defend myself to God's face. This will be my salvation, that a godless man shall not come before him. Listen carefully to my words. Let my declaration be in your ears. Behold, I have prepared my case. I know that I shall be vindicated. Who is there that will contend with me? For then I would be silent and die. Only grant two things to me. Then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand from me. Let not dread of you terrify me. Then call and I will answer. Or let me speak and do you reply to me. So he says, let's do a courtroom thing. Either you speak first and I'll defend myself or let me speak first as prosecutor and you, God, can defend yourself. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Why do you hide your face and count me as an enemy? So you get the hang of it, huh? And after we take your small group, we, you weren't asked to read the, any of the second or third cycle. We'll, I'll just read just a, there's a, a few passages that are really famous. And so we'll read them out of context. So, so you say you've read them. Uh, the, you know, if you know Hannah's Messiah, you know the aria, I know my soul, I know that my redeemer liveth. Okay, that's from Job. But it's totally twisted. It's not what Job, it's not what the book really says. It's what Christians wanted it to say. We'll look at that after a small group. Any questions, though? Yes, Vernon. Could you not also read Job's response as being somewhat... Uh, No, not at all. Well, again, you're 
trying to argue that Job is, he deserves this because he's mouthing off to God. And I would say that's not the Jewish way, you know, that you say it like it is. But guess, remember, the opening verse was, Job is a righteous man. And you're saying, well, but he's kind of not behaving. He's not behaving nice. He's kind of rubbing it in God's nose. That wouldn't bother. That wouldn't bother. I mean, remember, remember the, 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 the Psalms, the lament, you know, the cursing Psalms, you know. So to us, it seems that he's really forward. Like, you don't talk to God that way. <laughs> and, and we might agree. I might agree with you. You know, that's maybe not a good way to talk to God. But that's not his fault. That's not Job's fault. Job is just being honest. He's being frank. He's being frank. The Jewish writer, reader would not see that as anything but honesty. But congratulations. Yes? So kind of getting with what Bernie said, today we look at going to confession and we're all sinners. This is kind of like, I don't have any sin. I'm perfect. That's not the case in this situation. He is sinless. Again, remember, it's fiction. <laughs> he is sitting mean, the whole again the whole book is set up to have this debate about the law of retribution and so you have to have a character nothing bad should happen to him and the only way you can do that is by concocting a perfect character and so it's a concoction not, you know, we, I, none of us could speak these words of Joel <laughs> but again it's, it's a literary fiction to set up the real, the real action is the debate between the friends and Job, and then God steps in. So, good. I'm glad you asked the questions. They were great questions. Anything else? Why don't you move to a small group then? You move, pick out, move to a space you want to move. Um, there's, there's like there's eight or nine. There's a small group.